Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, so welcome to our last lecture for the first half of the semester. Okay, so uh, in today's lecture, all right, uh, we are going to be covering the serial communications protocol. All right, uh, it's nothing new to you, but uh, we're going to have a quick revision on the idea behind it and how we can program this real port on the uh, KL Dubai Z controller. All right, and uh, we will also be looking through the lab manual for this UART as well. Okay, and this uh, topic is basically the final topic that is going to be focused on the hardware, all right, of the microcontroller. All right, the board that you have is actually very powerful with a lot of other uh, features, but we do not have the time to go through all of that. All right, so uh, feel free to explore on your own uh, beyond this module as well. Okay, uh, but for now, with the UART complete, okay, by the end of today, you will have a clear idea of all the things that you need in order to complete the project. Okay, uh, so later on, all right, uh, I will also go go through the project specifications as well as the lab demo requirements for the UART. All right, uh, so all of those we will go through towards the end of the lecture. Okay, so uh, let me get started. Okay, uh, with our lecture. Okay, so um, just to be clear, everybody can hear me loud and clear? All okay? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so uh, in today's topic is on serial communication. Okay, and why is serial communication critical for us? Okay, because uh, all right, your project okay will involve uh, you developing a platform, a robotic platform. Okay, and this robotic platform okay is. Uh, Right, that you are going to be developing is going to be controlled through an app. Okay, so you're going to create an app with buttons. All right, and the way in which you're going to send these commands over to the uh, car is through a Bluetooth interface. Okay, so and that Bluetooth interface will even though the wireless protocol is Bluetooth, as uh, the interface to the actual controller itself will be through a serial, okay, or a UART. Okay, so that is why serial is very important to make sure that we are able to receive mm -hmm. the commands from the app, okay, to decode and control the robot accordingly. Okay, so later on, I will go through this. Uh, I have actually sent you an announcement, okay, with some uh, links where I explain to you how to create the app, okay? And also uh, how to do the overall connection, which I will also go through later, okay? Uh, so we will discuss more on the project and what you need to start working on, okay? So that you, you get things moving. Okay, so for the serial hardware part, okay, we are going to be going through some uh, basic concepts on the UART interface. Uh, of course, besides UART, there are two other very popular serial interface protocols, one is the SPI, and the other is I2C, okay? Uh, you may have come across this before and you may have actually also used them, all right? Uh, of course, when in, in most cases, sometimes because of all the entire plug and play uh, uh, nature of hardware nowadays, uh, even though it's using SPI protocol or I2C protocol, you may be using it without uh, fully understanding what is happening at the lower uh, levels of the hardware, all right? So uh, it is good to also read up more on these two protocols, okay, and get familiarized with them. Uh, many peripheral blocks uh, that interface to controllers will use one of these three, either UART, SPI, or I2C, okay? So it's good to be familiar with uh, these protocols so that in future, if you're going to develop your own uh, driver code or you're going to interface with peripherals and you need to do some modifications, you know what to do, okay? Uh, so why communicate serially, all right? So the uh, 
the logic is pretty simple because if you look at the way in which embedded systems is evolving, we are moving towards trying to squeeze as much as we can into the smallest form factor. All right, so that is why chips have been uh, increasing or uh, decreasing in size, okay, by shrinking their packages. And when you start to shrink their packages, what happens? You also start to have limited access to pins. All right, so we limited access to pins. Uh, that is where the need for multiplexing also comes in. All right, and together with multiplexing, you also need to think of how to communicate with other devices. All right, so if you were to think of it in a parallel kind of communication mode, if I say that my peripheral requires eight bits of data, all right, and just, just doing a read write control signals over here, okay, you can see that I need 10 wires at the bare minimum just to communicate with one peripheral block. So if I have four peripheral blocks, okay, which have the same requirement, I'm talking about 40 pins just to talk to these four devices. Okay, so you can see it is not a scalable solution. Okay, you are, you are having a lot of limitations when you try to deal with peripheral in this parallel mode of communication. Okay, uh, of course, the other alternative is if all the devices can be connected to the same bus. So this is the same bus. All right, and then I communicate with each device individually. All right, so I can't communicate with multiple devices at the same time, but I can do them one at a time. Okay, using appropriate uh, select pins. Okay, so this, okay, uh, if you look at most peripheral devices like memory chips and so on, you will usually have what is known as a CS pin. We see CS is basically chip select pin, which could be active high or active low. All right. And the idea of the chip select pin is to make sure that we are able to select the appropriate device that you want to talk to. Okay. So that is another possible solution. All right. Uh, but again, we are having some limitations in that we can only communicate with one peripheral at a time. And you are still using a fairly large number of pins, 14 pins right, in total to talk to these four devices. All right, so that is where the serial transmission idea comes in. So in serial transmission, you're talking about possibly just taking one line for clock and one line for data. Correct, so one device will do the transmission, okay, over a line. And then when you receive it, okay, you will be able to decode the data based on the clock. All right, so in some cases, you may have a positive edge clock or a negative edge clock that indicates the middle of the pulse. All right, so in either way, you can uh, that, uh, accurately decode the signal at the receiver side, okay, and then you can reconstruct the actual data. All right. So in the synchronous mode of operation, we are talking about sending a clock signal together with the data signal. All right. So that is one way of doing it. But as you can see, in this case, I need two lines. All right. I need two lines to transmit uh, my data. Okay. Uh, so of course, the advantage uh, of another variation to that is uh, either using full duplex or what we call half duplex. So when we say full duplex communication, both transmitter and receiver can send and receive concurrently. Okay, because you have one line for reading and one line for writing. Okay, so as you can see, the data in and data out both have two separate lines to the controller. Okay, so the microcontroller can do two-way transmission at the same time. Okay, so that is what we call full duplex mode of uh, communication. The other one is half duplex. So in half duplex, you only have a single data line. Okay, a single data line. That means you either transmit and then you wait for the receive data or you receive and then you wait to transmit. So either way, it's only one direction at any point of time. All right, so that is a half duplex mode of operation. So in all of this, you can see that 
we are still using the synchronous mode, which means I need to transmit a clock signal. So a clock signal has to be transmitted by the controller uh, while I'm communicating with my peripherals. Okay, in asynchronous mode of operation, you can cut back one more line and only send data. Okay, and only send data. So the clock, okay, or the sampling intervals are automatically known because you already pre-configure both the transmitter, okay, and receiver to operate at a fixed frequency. All right, so in asynchronous mode of operation, you need to make sure that the settings for both the transmitter and receiver are both consistent, all right, because you don't transmit a clock. So the receiver must know beforehand what rate I'm transmitting data so that when I detect the data is coming in, I know exactly what uh, interval I need to start sampling my incoming data. All right. And in order for us to be able to know when data is coming in, because as far as the receiver is concerned, if you look at the data line, all right, it will stay at a particular level until the first data comes in. All right. So in order for us to know when this event occurs, we will start off the communication with a start bit. All right. So a start bit in this case would be the the line being pulled to the low, all right? So by default, the idle line is high, okay? And the moment the receiver sees that the line goes low, okay, it goes low, then it is indication of a start bit. That means a data packet is coming in to the receiver, all right? And as you can see here, for the very first time, okay, I detect the start bit, mm -hmm. I will wait one and a half minutes of time to start sampling. Okay, so we always sample in the middle of the pulse, all right? Because as we know, uh, in reality, we never get a pulse like this, correct? This is only theoretical. In reality, the pulse will always be something like this. Okay, there will always be a, a rising and, and a decaying slope, a rising and falling slope. So we always want to avoid the transition and wait until the signal is stabilized. So that will always be somewhere in the middle. All right, so that is why we want to sample in the middle of the pulse duration. All right, so of course, all these timing parameters are already uh, set in hardware, okay, when you configure the registers. Okay, so we do not need to worry about it as long as the configuration and setup is correct. All right, once I finish with the data bits, I can also add in a parity bit. Okay, to perform any form of error detection. And I can also, and of course, after that, I need to put a stop bit. So this stop bit is to tell the receiver that I have completed one uh, packet of uh, data being transmitted out. Okay, so that is the whole idea of serial communication. Of course, there are variations to how many bits you want to transmit, the parity and how many stop bits and so on. Okay, so that depends on the controller you're using and what kind of uh, parameters you can set. Okay, so uh, the whole idea is the message is contained within that one frame. Okay, and that one frame is depending on how many bits you transmit and, and so on. Okay, uh, another common uh, parameter you will see in serial communication is what we call bot rate. Okay. Uh, so baud rate uh, and bit rate are they the same? Okay, when we say baud rate, okay, normally when we say baud rate is nine thousand six hundred, we equate it to nine thousand six hundred bits per second. All right, uh, if if you recall your uh, EPP two when you are uh, or EPP one when you doing the serial interface and so on, we always configure baud rate. But when we say baud rate, we also equate it to bit rate. Okay, so when two devices communicate, that is the rate at which data is being transmitted and received. Okay, but is it the case that baud rate is always equals to bit rate? Yes, no? Any answers?
okay so not necessarily okay by any reason why okay so uh, this is something you probably learn if you are doing a communications module okay uh, so baud rate generally refers to symbol rate okay the rate at which i transmit symbols so what is a symbol okay so in when we talk about bits we know the symbol is only zero or one okay we say it's only zero or one so since it can only take one or two possible values it, the baud rate is the same as the bit rate but imagine that instead of taking it as zero volt okay so from zero volt to let's say now uh, i go up to 3.3 volt right so currently i'm transmitting like this okay so each bit represents uh, or each symbol represents one bit okay so it's either a one or a zero or a one or a zero now imagine that right now i upgrade my system and i say that instead of saying zero volt and 3.3 volts i'm able to accurately detect intermediate voltages on my transmission line okay that means okay now i upgrade my system and i say that instead of zero volt to 3.3 volt it becomes zero volt one volt two volts and three volts okay that means i can potentially transmit a data that looks something like this okay something like that okay so what do you see if i can transmit a signal that has four different voltage levels and my receiver is also able to receive four different voltage levels and decode it correctly then i can say that each voltage level can be used to represent two bits correct this is 0 0 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 okay so now you see the idea of the symbol that means when i transmit this symbol it represents 0 1 when i transmit this symbol it trans it represents 1 1 okay so you can see that the baud rate okay can actually or your bit rate can be double your baud rate okay if your system is now able to uh, represent different voltage levels instead of just logic 0 and logic 1 okay so so that is the idea okay the idea behind it there is actually a lot of communication channels uh and communication technology that uses this kind of mechanisms all right so if you are interested you can read up more on how we encode signals how we decode signals so there's a lot of encoding schemes available okay where you can take this kind of uh, techniques to represent information or more information within a symbol all right so that is the idea or the difference between baud rate and bit rate okay but since we are in most cases dealing with this logic 0 and logic 1 we say that it is we is sort of equate baud rate and bit rate together okay uh, so coming back to here we say that uh, what we must do is we must make sure that the baud rate is configured to be the same for both transmitter and receiver okay prior to uh, any form of communication all right so that is the general idea okay we will talk a bit about error detection and so on but these are optional things that you don't necessarily have to do uh, for now okay uh, but it's good to know okay so for error detection okay uh, is basically to uh, to verify if the received data is correct or something uh, went wrong along the way all right so the the most sort of uh, primitive method of uh, error detection in serial data is using a uh, parity check method so in parity check okay what we do is we take a certain number of bits all right so for example if i take this data packet 0 1 1 1 0 1 so this is a 8 bit data all right and i want to uh, implement parity so when you say parity means i must first figure out what kind of parity i want so there's two types one is what we call odd parity or even parity 
Okay, so let's say I want even parity. So when I say even parity means I want even number of ones. Okay, so when I say even means, okay, I must have a even number of ones. So now let's look at this here. In this data packet itself, okay, I have six ones, which is already an even number. Correct, it's already an even number. That means the parity bit will be equals to zero. Okay, so the whole idea is when I add this parity bit inside this data packet, that means I append it together, I must get an even number of ones. So the entire data packet that you transmit, okay, will look like this now. So zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 okay, and then you add one zero inside. So you transmit this. This is what you transmit. All right. Of course, then it comes over to the receiver side. Okay. If the when the receiver receives the data, okay, he will also do the same check. Okay. So the configuration of both transmit and receiver must already match, right? That means if transmitter say even parity, then the receiver must also be configured for even parity. So when the receiver receives this data, it will go and count all the number of ones. And you will see that it is an even number. Correct? So if it is an even number, then no problem. It will say, okay, there is no issue. All right? But what if there is a error along the way? Okay, that means there is some interference and one of the bit got Flip, all right. So it can be any bit. It can be any bit. So assuming that this bit here, okay, this bit over here, from one it became a zero. Okay, so one of the bits got flipped. Okay, so if this bit originally is one, then by I receive it, it became a zero. All right. So when I do accounting, what do you see? You see that the I have five ones inside, okay, which is not even parity, okay, which is not even. So that will trigger an error, okay. So inside your receiver code, if you are having parity check, okay, you must, or your, your interrupt or your flag will tell you that there is a parity error in the received data packet, okay. So that is how you know that something went wrong. Okay, but as I mentioned just now, it is a very primitive method because it can only detect for odd number of errors. Okay, imagine that there is now a dual flip. Correct, this one became a zero and this zero, okay, imagine that it now become a one. Okay, if there is now a dual flip, what happened? Okay, you will see that now it also comes as six ones which is again even number, so you will say no error. All right, so it is a very primitive method. Okay, if there's an odd number of errors, then you can catch it. The moment it becomes an even number of errors, you will miss it. All right, so this is just one of the very basic ways of detecting error. Okay, there are of course a lot more complex ways of detecting and uh, fixing errors. Okay, uh, that is, uh, we will not cover all of that here, but when you are dealing with more complex data structures and more amount of uh, data that you want to transmit and receive, it's good to think of other mechanisms, of implementing other mechanisms to detect error. Okay, so there's two parts of this. Of course, one is error detection. Uh, in this case, there is no error correction. Okay, there's no error correction. That means if you receive a packet in error, you know it is, there is some error, but you do not know what is the error, correct? So the only way in which you can go about with the next step is either you discard it, all right, or you request the transmitter to send again. Okay, so it all depends on what kind of system you're dealing with. All right, for our project, okay, it is not necessary to have error detection, okay, because in most cases, you're only transmitting one byte at a time, okay, which is, uh, from what we have seen so far, it, it seems to work fine. 
okay? And since you have immediate feedback, all right, you don't necessarily have to worry about two-way communication, okay? Why, why do I say immediate feedback? Because when you press the button on your app, you will see uh, immediately the response on the system. Okay, so if it's not responding, you will automatically uh, press the button again, correct? Or do something else. So since you have that immediate feedback, if uh, some data packet was in error, you can immediately correct it. Okay, the moment you see the response uh, that is not matching what you expect. Okay, so that is for the error detection part. Okay, so now let's look at the software structure, okay, for handling asynchronous systems all right uh, so for asynchronous systems what we can say is you really do not know when the data is coming all right so since we do not know when the data is coming we need to be able to uh, capture this data the moment it arrives all right so your robot will definitely not know when the button is going to be pressed on your app all right so but the moment the button is pressed you must be able to respond okay uh, in the lab we are, I've, I've already given you the code, okay, but we'll be going through the code later, which is on the polling method. Okay, what you need to do is you need to uh, just make sure that that part you can follow through and make sure it's working. And then you need to transition to interrupts. All right, so interrupts are definitely the more efficient way of handling incoming data because it is something that is asynchronous and you do not know when it's going to happen. All right, so that is something that you need to implement for the project. Okay, so how about uh, in terms of data structures to support serial communication? Okay, so one way of doing it is what I'm going to talk to you today, which is about using a circular queue or a circular buffer, okay, to handle transmit and receive data. Mm -hmm. uh, you do not need this for the project also. All right, but why I'm sharing this with y'all is because this is one way of dealing with uh, situations where you can potentially have multiple uh, sets of data that you need to transmit or, or you expect to receive, but it takes time for you to process that data. Okay, so in cases like that, you need to have some buffer to hold on to the data first while you are either transmitting or receiving. Okay, why we don't need for our project is because whenever you press a button, you will send a byte and you will immediately decode that byte and you will process it. Okay, so it is not necessary, okay, but it is something that is useful for you in cases where you have a lot of data coming in from maybe potentially many different sources. Okay, so let me uh, go through with you the idea first, okay, and then later we'll look at how we implement it in the implement a more simpler structure in the lab. Okay, so this part here is, is uh, on the interrupts, okay, but we will come to interrupts later. Okay, let's look at this idea of implementing queue. All right, so the whole idea of a queue is like a, the fact that it becomes a circular buffer. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to have two queues. All right, one for transmit, okay, and one for receive. And for both of this, you are going to create an array. All right, and going to have three uh, sets of data. One is to point to the head, one is the tail, and the other is to keep track of the size. Okay, now let's look at the code here to understand what is happening. All right. Okay, so in this code here, what you see here is we are going to initialize the queue where all the elements in the queue are initially zero and the head and the tail are all pointing to zero, size is also zero. Okay, so let me draw it over here. Okay, so I have one for transmit. Okay, so I'm going to simplify and I'm going to keep the queue size as five. Okay, so zero, one, Okay, so this is zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, and the receive also I have another buffer. Okay. So again, it's only a size of five. And from initialization, we know that the head 
and the tail or point here, point to element zero. Okay, and the size is also initially set to zero. Okay, so now let's say you want to transmit data out. Okay, so what you would do is you can put, or you can call this function Q and Q. All right, so if you look at the next page, Q and Q basically takes a data and puts it into the Q. Okay, so in Q and Q, what you would do is you take the data and you first check, is it full? Okay, so this full check is what? This full check is actually here, whether the size is matching five. Okay, once the size equals to five, then you know that your buffer is full already. Okay, buffer is full already. So as long as it's not full, then what you can do, you can take the data D, okay. So you can take the data D and put it into the place where the tail is pointing to. Okay, and then increment the tail. So currently my tail is pointing here. So let's say my D is currently having a value of, uh, let's say seven. So I put a value of seven here. All right, then my tail plus plus, all right? That means the tail is now going to point here. All right? Mm -hmm. And then I check, and then I do this uh, mod operation here between tail and size. All right, so this is to make sure that if I hit the, I already updated to the last element in my buffer and I increment one more time. Okay, that means if let's say currently my tail value is four, after I put in to my last element here, it will become five, all right? Because of tail plus plus. So when I do a percentage equals to five, what will happen? It will become zero. So I'll point back. So I'll point back to the zero over here. All right, so that is how you implement a circular buffer. That means once I reach the end, I will actually circle back to the front again. Okay, but of course, we are also keeping track of the size here. Okay, so we know once it is full. All right, so that is why this check over here in the beginning ensures that we do not update it if it is full. All right. So you can imagine that now when the next data comes in, let's say the next data that comes in is let's say uh, three. Okay, so the three will be updated here and then I'll go on and so on. So the NQ operation allows me to fill up the buffer. All right. And when I'm ready to take this data and transmit out using the serial port, for example, then what I do is I can DQ the data. Okay, so the DQ operation is to take the data out of the queue, okay, and then pass it to the next stage. So in this case, the whole idea of these two buffer is my, I have a lot of data that I want to transmit out, for example, but my serial process takes time, all right, but my data is, is, is getting prepared much faster, all right. So in order for me to hold on to this data, I put it in a buffer first, and then as and when my transmit module is free, I can DQ and then pass it off, get to my transmitter code to send it out. Okay, so in the DQ operation, what I do is I check whether it's empty or not. Okay, as long as it's not empty means I will, I'm able to take the data. How do I know it is empty? I check whether the size is zero. Okay. And when I DQ, I DQ from the head. Okay, that means the first data that comes out will be the seven. Okay, the seven comes out. Okay, and once I take out the data, you can see that I replace that data with a zero. Okay, that means once I DQ seven out, I replace it with a zero. Okay, again, this is just to simplify debugging. Okay, so that you are able to keep track of which uh, data has already been filled up or used and so on. All right, and similarly, when my queue head also wraps around, 
I will go back to the beginning. And every time I DQ, I decrement my size. Okay, so you can see that this structure, okay, this data structure, what it does is it fills up using the tail and then it takes out using the head. All right, and by using this, we are able to implement this circular buffer operation all right, and keep a buffer of data that is always ready to be transmitted out or whenever you're receiving data. Okay, so this is useful, okay, in cases where for example, you have a lot of data that you need to send out, okay, or you're receiving a lot of data. Okay, then you can use this mechanism to buffer it first and then read it out later on. Okay, so that is where you can use a, a data structure like this. Okay, uh, again, I'm telling that we do not need to implement this for the project because in our project, as uh, we'll talk about later, you are going to send one byte at a time whenever you press a button on your phone all right so the moment the byte is received you will immediately be able to process it okay and perform the necessary action okay so you do not need to buffer anything because the moment the data comes in you process it and immediately sort of carry out the action okay so you don't need to implement this circular buffer for the project okay so to use the, the queues you can end queue or you can dequeue all right, so the one of the things that you need to look at for the project is how to decode your messages. All right, so one the thing you must remember is you're going to send one byte of data at a time. Okay, so one byte of data at a time. So what you need to do is you need to decide, okay, how you're going to uh, encode the information within this 8 bits. All right, so you can say that maybe I set aside 2 bits for my LED or 3 bits for my LED, okay, uh, another 2 bits for my motor, okay, or if you want 3 bits for LED, 3 bits for motor, it's up to you, okay, and maybe some other uh, is control or audio or things like that, okay. So what is important is you must make a decision, all right, when you're designing or your architecture, which bits will correspond to what action you want the system to carry out. All right, and then your code on your app must also match what your uh, controller is expecting to receive, okay? If there is a match, then there's no problem. Everything will work, all right? In most cases, uh, what happens is you may write a code that maybe the last two bits is the LED. All right, but then later on in your controller side, you go and look at maybe the first two bits instead of the last two bits, correct? And then you keep thinking why the LED is not responding. All right, so uh, this is where all, all the troubleshooting techniques will come in, okay, which I will show you later, where you will be required, okay, uh, or it's good to be able to hook up the oscilloscope and check the signals to see what exactly is happening. Right, then from there you can decode and then uh, see for yourself whether what I send is what I receive and is it matching with what I expect in my code. All right. Okay, so let's uh, go into the actual KL25Z and see how we can implement the serial protocol. All right, uh, so this picture shows you the mappings of the various uh, UART modules uh, or pins okay you also see the spi and spsc but you're not using that okay uh so can you tell me all right so for our code we are going to be using the ur2 okay i will uh, share why in a while okay but we're going to be using ur2 in the lab manual all right can you go through the data sheet and tell me the ur2 which are the pins i can use Okay, which are the pins I can use for my uh, on the KL25Z port if I want to use UR2 as my serial uh, peripheral block? Okay, can you all open up your data sheet and check?
Okay, so if you open up a data sheet, okay, you should go to the table on the multiplex sheet, correct? On chapter 10. Right, so if you go here, you can see that uh, UR2 okay, is uh, so UR2. Okay, so you can see it over here port D2, port D3. Okay. U R two R X and T X. Similarly, over here, port D four, port D five. Okay, and uh, if you go up here, you can also see over here, port E twenty two, port E twenty three. Okay, so as uh, similar to the P W M uh, lecture that what we saw, that the same peripheral block might be mapped to different pins. All right, on your controller. All right, uh, as long as those pins are available for us to use, then you can use them. All right, uh, and of course, you need to look at the alternate functionality as well. Which alternate function is it? Okay, so in the lab, we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be using the UR2 map to port E22 and 23. Okay, because those pins are the ones available here. Okay, so we're going to be using these two pins for the lab manual all right, five for us to test out and see how this works. All right, so uh, as before, we need to make sure that clock gating is done. All right, so later when we look going through the code, I will come back to this again. But as before, you need to do clock gating and you need to do clock gating for both the main port as well as the peripheral subsystem. That means in this case, since I'm using port E, okay, I need to enable clock for port E to set the correct multiplexing options. And I also need to enable the clock for the UR2 module. Okay, so I need to do two level of clock uh, settings to make sure the serial port is working fine. Okay, uh, so okay, so this transmitter basics, uh, I will not go through again. But basically, uh, in our case, it is the same as what we saw just now. All right, where you have a start bit followed by data bits zero to seven, okay? And the least significant bit followed all the way up to the most significant bit. Then you can have a parity bit and stop bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you look in your, Okay, so the, uh, later we look at the data sheet again, okay? Uh, so for the receiver basics, it's the same as before. You will wait until the start bit is detected and then wait for one and a half bits before it starts sampling. So all of this is the same as what we saw just now, okay? Uh, and what I said earlier again holds true, both transmitter and receiver must have already been configured to be the same in terms of the clock frequency settings, all right, the baud rate, okay, how many bits you're transferring, how many stop bits, okay, uh, and so on. In parity and, and all these things. Okay, so for the UART module in the KL25Z, there are actually three UART modules, okay, UART0 and followed by UART1 and UART2. All right, the UART0, we can't use it because in our debug mode, we're actually using it. All right, so whenever we connect our USB cable to the debug port on the board and we are running our code, we are actually using the UART0 to do the debugging. Okay, so that is not available. So what we can use is UART1 or UART2. Okay, so that is the reason why we have chosen UART2. Okay, so if you look at the transmitter module, you can see that uh, you have this uh, register here, shift register, that will shift the data out, okay? through the pin, okay, through the TX pin over here. So this data comes in through the, uh, comes in uh, or gets shifted out and then it goes out to the TX pin. Of course, all these other peripheral blocks are for, or peripheral uh, registers you see here are for the configuration and settings, okay? So if I want to 
uh, enable interrupt okay so there are some registers involved for the interrupt okay i need to also configure the baud rate okay what is the frequency at which the data is being transmitted out okay so these are some of the things as well as parity if i want parity then i also have some bits to configure for parity okay so we'll be going through all of those bits later on okay when i'm going through the code with you similarly for the receiver when the receive data comes in over here okay, when the receive data comes in over here okay it will then be uh, going through some blocks here and then it will get shifted in okay so it will get shifted in all the way and why it is shifted in you will also be able to detect some parity all right and also detect for any uh, error and so on all right uh, but of course uh, it all depends on how you have configured it all right and whatever that you have also configured for the baud rate generation will be used for both the transmitter and receiver okay your uart module okay when it receives incoming data it actually does oversampling okay uh, and the reason for oversampling is because you want to improve your noise immunity okay uh, so in cases where there could be a noise spike okay in the middle of a pulse or the there is some delay in the transition okay instead of uh, of rising or falling within a certain specification it's a bit slower at sometimes the oversampling helps to uh, detect the majority okay so it, the hardware itself allows some internal voting process all right that means it samples and then looks at what is the majority vote and then it decides whether this particular bit is a one or a zero okay uh UR zero we are not using but it provides some uh, options on how fast you want to oversample UART one and UART two which uh, we are using has a fixed 16 times oversampling Okay, why is this 16 times oversampling uh, important? Because we need to factor that when we are calculating the baud rate value to put into the register. Okay, so the formula is given here where your baud rate is equal to the UART module clock divided by the register value multiplied by 16. Okay, why we need to multiply by 16 is because we having this internal 16 times uh, oversampling all right and to factor that in we need to use that inside the calculation all right so what we want to find is what is this register value okay so if i already know what is my baud rate okay so using this formula example here you can see that if i want a baud rate of 4800 and my uart module clock is at 24 megahertz then i just put everything into this formula i can get the value that I want. So this is the value that should be written into the SBR register. All right. So in cases of decimal, okay, you round to the closest integer value. So either way, you will have some slight error. All right. But in most cases, it is fine. Okay. So that is the baud rate generator uh, value we need to calculate. So again, I'll go through all of this in the code. Okay. So for transmit and receive. Okay, there are two register bits you need to look at. One is called the transmit data register empty and receive data register full. All right, so by looking at these particular bits, all right, I will know whether my transmit data is empty, the register is empty. So when the register is empty means I can put data in and start to transmit out. Similarly, if I receive a data that the receive data register full flag will be set okay and then i know that some data has come in and then i can go and read it okay so we are going to be looking at it in the code using the polling approach all right and then the interrupt is something that you need to develop for the project okay so these registers and all i will go through okay uh, in the actual code itself okay so i think right now what we will do is uh, now it's 10 55 we will take a short 10 minutes break all right and when we come back from the break i will go through with you the actual lab manual and the code and demonstrate to you what you're going to be seeing okay and then you have an idea of exactly how the entire serial module works 
Okay, so uh, and later on, I also talk on the project as well as the midterm. Okay, uh, so I will see you all back here at uh, eleven o five. All right. Okay, so um, welcome back. Okay, so I was just setting up the hardware to show you what's happening. Okay, so let's go through the code first. Okay, to understand uh, what is happening. Okay, so let me share the screen. Uh, at the same time, uh, we'll also be switching between the code and the data sheet all right, to understand uh, the, the steps involved. Okay, so in our code here, uh, I have a function okay, to initialize the bot rate. Okay, so let's look at that function, init bot rate, so init UART. Okay, so the init UART, okay, there are two uh, main steps. I mean, there are a few steps involved. The first step is you want to enable clocking. Again, as I mentioned, you need to enable clocking for both the uh, UART module as well as the port module. Okay, since we are using uh, port E in UART 2, okay, you need to make sure that you enable both of them okay, in your code. So, uh, SCGC 4 and SCGC 5, if you look at both of these registers, the SCDC form is to configure the UART for the full block, enable power to that. And SCDC 5 is for the port. Okay. Uh, as before, you'll always make use of the existing uh, macros and uh, definitions already given to us in the data part. Okay, so that is the first step we're going to do. We need to enable the clock. Okay, the next is the port PCR, the multiplex option. All right, and uh, looking back just now, okay, at the uh, configuration, okay, the multiplexing configuration, you can see that uh, both port E22 and 23 for UR2 functionality is given as alternate port. Okay, given as alternate for, so that is why we are using the alternate for function here. All right, so this part we know. Now is the configuration of the actual UART module. All right, so this is where the registers come in. So the register that we're going to do uh, configure first is the C2 register. Okay, so let's look at the C2 register. Okay, so whatever I'm explaining here is what is actually explaining the, the slides. Okay, but instead of going through that and directly looking at the code, so it's easier for us to relate. Okay, so let me go down to the C2 register. Okay, so this C2 register uh, has a few different configurations here. Uh, the first four here are related with interrupts. Okay, so that is something that you need to look into. Okay, after you complete the polling part. Okay, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, disable the transmitter and receiver. So, this transmit enable pin and receive enable pin, we are going to disable them. All right, uh, this is always a good practice because uh, not only for you, what any uh, peripheral block, whenever you are going to make any configuration changes it's good to disable the block first all right do the changes and then we enable it after that all right so you can see later on over here this last line here is to re-enable both the transmit and receive all right so first i disable do all my configuration and after that i enable okay now so what are the configurations we need to do the first thing is the bot rate calculation Okay, so the way the KL25Z uh, works is there is a default system clock. All right, uh, again, if you uh, look at the sample code that is given, we have already configured the default system clock. Okay, to uh, one clock setup as one. So the default clock is now 48 megahertz. Okay, so with 48 megahertz, okay, that is the main default system clock. What the microcontroller does is it actually divides this clock. 
okay, uh, to for different subsystems, okay, and the UART module, okay, actually has a B4 system clock by two. All right, so this is the way it is really designed within the hardware, all right, and based on the configuration setup of one. Okay, so that is why over here we need to do this. We need to say that the bus clock, that means the clock that is actually clocking the UART module, is half of the system clock. Okay, so it's going to be running at 24 megahertz. Okay, so that is something that you need to do over here. Okay, this again because of the way that controller is designed and our clock setting. The three lines here are actually based on what we just saw in our slides, where we say that we need to use the formula okay, to calculate the board rate. See this formula here, where we say that the board rate is the UR clock divided by SBR times 16. So what you want is the SBR value, that is the value to put in the register. So that is bus clock divided by board rate times 16. Okay, and that will give us a value, all right? But the board rate register value, okay? If you look here, it's actually 13 bits. SBR clock zero is 13 bits. All right, and this is actually divided into two separate registers, okay, which are your uh, DDH, okay, board rate uh, divider H, okay, and low, the high register and low register. All right, so what we are doing here is just making sure that the lower bits have the value and the upper bits are the value shifted down by it. Okay, so basically what is happening is we're taking the entire 13 bits, we're shifting eight bits down so that the remaining bits go into the high register and the low register has the original uh, lower eight bits. All right, so that is what these uh, three lines are doing for us. They are basically calculating the board rate and putting it into both the register, the BDH and the BDL. Okay, so if you look up here, Okay, so these are the two registers, the BDH, okay, is a 13 bit board rate, and then followed by the BDL register. Okay, so as you can see, the BDL register is only eight bits. Okay, it's only eight bits. So that is why when I just take it with this macro over here, it automatically takes the lower eight bits. Okay, so these are all the built-in macros that do all the shifting and masking for us. All right, so uh, we don't need to worry about that. We just use the macros to do all of that for us. And we assign it to both the BDH and BDL. Okay, so that is the board rate calculation. And what is the board rate I have chosen? Okay, so the board rate is a parameter that I have passed in over here, and that is actually 9600. Okay, why 9600? Because the Bluetooth module that I have given to you, the BTO6 module. Okay, so that module uh, by default is operating at this rate. Okay, so by, by sticking to this same uh, board rate value, it makes it easier. All right, for us to uh, integrate the BTO6 module with the KL25. Okay, so that is why we are using 9600. Okay, next is these three registers C1, S2, and C3. All of them are zero. Okay, so let's just have a look at what these three registers are C1, S2, and C3. Okay, so the C1 register, as you can see, is used okay, for a lot of things like, uh, okay, so the main thing that so far we looked at is how many bits we want to uh, deal with. In our case, we are only dealing with 8 bit, all right, so that is the normal mode of operation. We don't have a 9 bit uh, of data, so we don't need to configure or change that value, all right, and the rest of it we are not using. So we are not using parity. Okay, so since we are not using parity, all right, and the rest of it is not uh, something that we have looked at. We are going to just leave it as zero. Okay, so that is why the C1 register, we are writing zero to it. Okay, S2 and C3. Okay, C3 and C3. Okay, so this is the S2 register. For the S2 register, uh, again, if you look at it, these are related with uh, the other sort of characteristics of how the serial can behave. So uh, 
uh, line break detection, receiver active, uh, break character, and so on. So these are very, very uh, specific ways in which we can configure the behavior, but we are not doing anything, uh, we're not changing anything here. All right, we are using the very simple, basic UART mode of operation. So this register is also zero. So we're not going to change any of the default settings. Okay, for this register as well. Okay, so this is the S2 register. And then finally, the C3 register. Okay, so if you look at the C3 register, okay, the C3 register, these are again for the ninth bit of data transmission. Okay, and then the other bits over here are to enable interrupts for error detection. Okay, so parity error, fading error, and so on. So again, I'm not using any of these in my code. All right, so all of these are zero. Okay, so these three registers contain uh, a lot of uh, bits where you can configure the behavior uh, if you are looking at something very specific and something different from the usual. Okay, but in our case, we're using the standard UART mode of operation, eight bits, single stop bit, no parity, and so on. Okay, so because of uh, yeah, the basic configuration we're using, we do not need to change anything here. All right, once all of this is done, we can enable the transmit and receive modules. Okay, so that is basically a setup. All right, and inside my code here, okay, basically what I'm doing is I'm doing a transmit. Okay, the receive part later I'll show you. So here, I'm first doing the transmit of this character 0x69. Okay. Uh, let's look at this code UX UR2 transmit 4. So in UR2 transmit 4, what am I doing? I'm looking at the S1 register and I'm doing an end with the TDRE mask. Okay, so let's look at that S1 register and TDRE mask. Okay, so in S1 register, the TDRE, this bit 7, is 1 when the transmit data register is empty. All right, zero in it is full. So if I look at the code here, while this end with this, all right, so when I end with this, all right, if it is zero, okay, so if I look here, if it is zero means it is full, okay, if it is one means it's empty, okay, so that means while it is full, okay, I wait here, all right, okay, while it's full, I wait here, the moment it is not Cool. That means it is empty, I will come here. Okay, because for it to be full, okay, this has to be one. All right. And once uh, it is TDRE is one, means it is empty. All right. So once the transmit data register is empty, okay, I will be able to get out of this while loop. Okay, and once I get out of this while loop, I can put in uh, the current data into my D register, UR2 D register. Okay, once I put data into my D register, what happens? Okay, so if you look back at the configuration of the hardware, you can see that once the data comes in over here, once data gets transmitted to the D register, it automatically gets pushed down to the shift register, which will start to shift data out, okay, to the TX2. All right, so that is basically what we need to do. We need to check for the TDRE bit because the TDRE bit is a one, means it is empty. Once it is empty, I'm able to get out of this loop, okay? All right, so why it is zero, okay? So when I end with a zero, and I do a not of it, it will be a one. All right, so that is why I will start here while it is zero. Once it becomes a one, that means it is empty, I will exit this loop and I'll be able to update my D register with the new data. Once I update with the new data, it will automatically get shifted out. All right, and I will see it on my transmit pin. All right, on my uh, UART module. Okay, so let's see that first. Let's see that happening. So where is my transmit pin? Okay, so coming back here, you can see that my transmit pin is over this top right hand corner, okay? where I have my connectors and it's one, two, three, four, the port pin on the left side. Okay, that is PTE22. Okay, port E22 is my transmit pin. Okay, so I also label it over here. TX is port E22. Okay, so let's look at it over here. 
All right, so here you can see that I have connected okay, the pin. Okay, so this is not very clear, but I hope you can see. All right, so over here, if I count is one, two, three, four, is a port pin, okay, from the top left hand side. Okay, so that is the TX pin. All right, and uh, once I run my code, okay, you can see. Okay, let me show you the screen as well. Okay, so that is basically what you observe when you look at the data. Okay, so let me adjust this. Okay, so let's look at this data and try to make sense of it. Okay, let's try to make sense of it. Okay, so you can see that the data here. Let me share, let me adjust this. Okay, so if I were to look at the data here, you will see that I have a straight line and then one pulse here, okay, followed by two, two width here, okay, followed by a pulse, up, then again two, okay, and then here, and then up again, all right. So you can see that the idle line, okay, so the idle line by default it is high, all right, and then what do you see? You see that it goes low. Okay, it goes low over here. And then, so this is a zero. Then this is one, zero, zero, one. All right. Okay. And then zero, one, one, zero. And then it goes high. Okay, so what is happening here? So, can you tell me what is this zero? Yes, that is the start bit. Okay, so this is the start bit. All right, and then this one zero zero one is the nine, and this is the six. And this is the stop bit after that. Okay, so you can see that the transmission is going out based on least significant bit first, followed by the most up to the most significant bit, and then the stop bit. All right, which tallies with the understanding. All right, from our data sheet also. All right, so if you look back at our data sheet, the block diagram here. Okay, so from this block diagram also, you can see that the bit that goes out is the least significant bit first. All right, followed by all the way to the most significant bit. All right, so that is what you are seeing over here as well. Okay, so that is uh, basically what you're supposed to observe, okay, when you hook up your pin to the transmit pin, uh, or hook up the scope to the transmit pin of the uh, scope, okay? Uh, I mean, transmit pin on the board. All right, uh, and let's look at the lab manual. So in the lab manual, okay, you're supposed to, uh, okay, so this lab manual is where you need a demo. Okay, and the demo's uh, deadline is 12 March, which is about, yeah, about slightly less than a month away. All right, so you have more than enough time, okay, I've given you to complete the demo, okay, through your PA, all right. So what you need to demo, so all of this is to make sure you understand what is happening, all right, uh, in terms of the transmit, the receive, and so on, okay. Now, uh, again, this is the kind of waveform you are expected to uh, observe and see. Okay, so it basically knows that it's a stop, it expects a stop bit the moment mm -hmm. it 
has received the expected number of bits. That means if you have already configured it as 8-bit data transmission, after it finishes the 8-bit, it expects that the next bit should be a high, that is the stop bit. Okay? So that is how it knows that it is the end. Okay, if it does not see that it is a high, that means something has gone wrong. Okay, so that is why you have the error uh, interrupts and so on being triggered. Okay, so what you need to demo is this part two, which is UART over Bluetooth. Okay, UART over Bluetooth. All right, so let me uh, explain to this uh, to you first. Okay, and then I'll show you a demo of uh, how this whole thing comes together. Okay, so let me explain to you what you need to do, which is actually explained in the video as well that I have sent to you. Okay, so in order for you to hook up uh, your entire system together, okay, uh, what you need to do is you need to connect up your Freedom Board, okay, together with your Bluetooth, Bluetooth module, BTO6 module, and you need a 7805 regulator. Okay, why? You need this 7805. So this is basically a 5 volt regulator. Okay, 5 volt regulator. And where the center pin is a ground. Okay. Uh, and this 7805, what it gives us is it gives us a fixed plus 5 volts at the output. The input can be anything bigger than 5 volts. So that is where your battery pack or your 9 volt comes in. So you can use your nine volts battery, okay, as one possible input uh, power to this regulator, and the output will be a fixed five volts. Okay, why you need a fixed five volts here is because your BTO six needs a higher voltage than what your freedom board can uh, supply. Okay, so this plus five volts, you connect it to the VCC on your BTO six module. Okay, if you have your BTO six module with you, you can take it out and have a look. Okay, you will see that there are four pins. Okay, one is transmit, uh, two of them are transmit receive, the other is VCC and ground. So the plus five volts will go here. Okay, and your ground, okay, uh, all the ground pins must be connected together. Okay, I think we have uh, emphasized this before in EPP1 as well. You need to have a common grounding between different subsystems. Okay, so that all the logic levels are interpreted correctly. Okay, so the ground should all be interconnected. Okay, so the Freedom Board is running on 3.3 3. Uh, 3 volts, 3.6 volts, okay? Uh, the V-in, that is to provide an input voltage. It doesn't generate an output voltage. Okay, the Freedom Board. So the Freedom Board's voltage is not enough to power the BTO6 module. So that is why you need a separate 5 volt to power this. Okay, so that is why I'm giving you the 7805 over here. All right. Now, over on your side, when you're creating the app, okay, you're going to create an app, okay? Um, so what I have shown you in the uh, video, I hope you have had a look so far, is this using this platform called the MIT App Inventor. And again, why I suggest this is only because it is a very easy, straightforward drag and drop interface, okay? Uh, there are no marks given to app design. All right, so you do not need to spend a lot of time trying to create something very fanciful, okay? Uh, because that is not the objective of the module, okay? The objective of the module is to make sure that app is able to send commands which you will interpret, okay, uh, on the system. And this is one of the easiest ways to do it. If you want to use any other programming language or tool to do it is also fine. All right, uh, as I mentioned in the announcement, this has, was originally designed for Android apps uh, and they have been working on an iOS version, uh, but I think it has been delayed quite a bit. Okay, so uh, as long as somebody in your group has an Android phone, then it's good. If not, you need to look around and see who can lend you any old phone or something that you can use, all right? Uh, so that is the, the way in which you can develop the app quite easily all right, without too much of time and effort. Okay, so later I will show you uh, the app part of what I've done. Okay, so over 
when you create the app, the first thing you need to have is you need to have a connect button uh, to connect with this BTO6. So before connecting, you need to do a pairing. Okay, uh, I think all of us have used Bluetooth headphones or something before. So you need to do a pairing. So the very first time you do a, you switch on your Bluetooth and you search for this device. Okay, it will ask you to pair. All right. I mean, when you click on this device and you ask you to pair, it will ask you for a password. All right. In most cases, it will already prompt you is either zero 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 or one two three four. That is the default password. To pair with the module. Okay, you need to do the pairing first, all right? And then when you do the connection, when you click on the connect button, you will be able to view this device as one of the devices you can connect with. Okay, once you connect, all right, so by default, you will see one red LED here blinking. Okay, the once you connect, it will stop blinking, it will be a solid red. Okay. And once it is a solid red, that means it is already connected, it's ready to receive command. So what will happen is, uh, later I'll show you in the code, you can, you can have buttons here for all the different things that you want to send over. Okay, uh, in the tool, there are a lot of different input um, options. You have sliders, you have push button, you have a lot, a lot of different uh, ideas you can, you can implement. Again, it's up to you. As long as your robot you can control, it is fine. Okay, that is the objective. Okay, there's no point trying to create something very fanciful, but then in the end, your robot cannot move properly. Right? Then there's no point. Okay, as long as it is simple and it's easy for you to use it, then that is the, the main objective. Okay, so once you have established this Bluetooth connection, when you send any command over, Okay, we send a command over. We are going to send one byte at a time. All right, and this byte that we send over to the Bluetooth module will come out from the TX pin. Okay, to the UART. That means this UART receive is actually what we need to program on the Freedom Board. Okay. We are not having any two-way communication. If you want two-way communication, it's fine, but it does not serve any particular purpose, like I said, because it is not like your uh, EPP2 where you can't see your robot. Right? You can't see your robot, so you need to get some feedback to know what is happening. All right, then you want two-way feedback. Okay, I mean two-way communication, so you want the robot to send data back to the app so you can see what is happening. But in our case, you are able to see and control it in person. All right, so you don't need to send data back to the app. You just need to have one-way communication. So when I press a button, that one byte of data transmits over Bluetooth and the BT06 module converts it into a serial uh, format and transmits out to the TX pin. Okay, so what I need to do is on my Freedom Board, I program the receiver module, okay, to receive these data packets and then interpret them, okay? So over here, okay, what, so what you need to do is, the important thing is the protocol must match. Okay, the protocol must match between here and here. Okay, so for example, okay, for example, if I say that I want, my data packet is one byte, and if I say that I want to set aside the last three bits, okay, as an indication of uh, my LED control. Again, this is just example only. Yeah? So if I say that the last bit is on off and then the other two bits is to indicate which LED I want. All right. Then you can see that if I want my red LED to light up. Okay, if I want my red LED to light up, it will be 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so I think something is missing here. So 0, uh, Yeah. So if I want the red LED to light up, let me see, let me see. Zero, one, one, yeah, correct. Okay, so this is to say on, okay, and this is to say off. Okay, that is the last bit. And then these two bits here is to say is red. Okay, because I'm referring to this over here. 
Okay, so you can see that I must first come up with a, a protocol uh, to represent all the different commands I want to support. Okay, so in your case, you may have LED, you may have motor. Again, you do not need to uh, think of it as LED or motor. You can just say that I send a particular command, which is to move forward. And the moment I receive a command to say move forward, I will interpret the LED action, the audio function, all of that on the freedom board. All right, so you don't need to send specific commands for LED, motor, uh, audio, all of which from the app. You can send a command and then that command could automatically be interpreted on the freedom board to trigger the different uh, subsystems accordingly. Okay, so as long as you know what you're sending and what you're expected to receive, then that is fine. All right, so that is basically the idea of the whole interface. Okay, so you are going to create an app that's going to send a data packet over. Okay, though it is Bluetooth, your BTO6 translates to serial, and your Freedom Board is going to receive the data and then you're going to interpret the data to carry out certain actions. All right, so that is uh, the, how the whole thing is going to come together. So let me just show you the app. Okay, so on the app side, Okay, if you're going to use this, all right, like I said, it's all very easy. Just drag and drop kind of an interface. All right, you don't need to think too much. Okay, it's very easy, okay? Uh, so for the connect button and everything, I've given you all the details on how to use it, okay? In terms of uh, the pick, uh, list picker, okay? How to use it for your uh, implementation in the video I've explained, all right? And then here I have Two buttons, red LED on, red LED off, red LED on, red LED off. Okay. And over here, what I've done is I've also created the appropriate function so that if I click on each of these buttons, I will send some number. Okay, three, two, five, four, and so on. So these numbers are uh, again, I'm looking at it from the binary perspective, right? When I send a number, which bits will be one, which bits will be zero. And over at the freedom board, I will also interpret those those bits, okay, to decide what I want to do. Okay, so let me set up, okay, so give me about two minutes, let me set up the, uh, the Bluetooth module part and then I'll show you the whole thing, how it's going to come together, okay? Okay, so let me uh, share with you the screen now. Okay, so here you can see that the Bluetooth module connected up with the regulator. Okay, so this is the uh, 7805 regulator. Okay, so here the three pins. So this leftmost pin is currently being powered by my nine volt battery over here. Okay, and then center pin is brown and the other pin is directly connected to the power over here. All right, and over at the Bluetooth module, what I've done is I connected the pin to the receive of my uh, freedom board okay and I've also connected the scope pin over here so you can uh, later see when data is being transmitted okay now let's look at the app okay so this is what I said just now the LED will be blinking red LED will be blinking uh, continuously before we connect okay so let me uh, show you the phone okay so when you click on connect over here Okay, it will show you a list of uh, devices. So in order for your device to appear, it has to be paired beforehand. All right, so in this case, my HC06 here is already paired. All right, so when I click on it, okay, it will connect. When it connects, uh, so, uh, so when it connects, you can see that the red LED now has stopped blinking. Okay, it is now a solid, solid red. Okay, previously it was blinking. Okay. Now, when I click on the red LED on button, okay? Okay, okay, uh, sorry, because I'm still running the old code from just now. Okay, so let me open up my code. Um,
Okay, give me a minute. Ah, let me open up the correct code. Okay, so now, once it is connected, when I click on the red LED on, the red LED lights up. Okay, similarly, red LED off, green LED on. Okay, I'm not sure why the green looks black on your screen, but uh, for the phone part. Okay, so somehow the green LED looks uh, black. I don't know why. Okay, uh, but it's basically green LED, uh, and green LED off, and red LED on, and red LED off. Okay, uh, and as you can see on the oscilloscope, okay, uh, the signals, you can see that it is being toggling, okay, while some data is being sent. Let me come back to the uh, app inventor and, and the code. So over here you can see that I'm sending a data packet of three to on the red LED and a data packet of two to off the LED. So that means it is similar to this, right? Where three is to on and two is to off. Okay. So what I need to do is over on my code. the freedom board okay uh, let's look at the code over here okay so in the receive poll okay okay what you are doing is so in transmit you are waiting for the tdre bit to be set in the in the receive mode you are looking at the rdrf so if you look at the rdrf okay uh, this bit file over here when it is zero the radar register is n okay so you can see here that wait until i receive data register is full so it means i will be stuck in this line this while loop okay until the data register flag becomes set that means it is full okay that means i will receive a new data from the app okay and once i receive the data i will be able to return that data Okay, so this is a polling function. And once I get that data, then I can just do some if else or whatever based on how you have designed your LED functions. All right, so of course, this is different depending on how you have designed LED function. But the whole idea is once I receive the data, okay, you can now extract out the bits that match uh, what you are expecting to receive. Okay, so in my case, since I'm only interested in the last three bits, I will look at the last three bits and then decide whether the LED should be on or off or what I should do. All right, so that basically uh, wraps up the entire thing that you're supposed to be uh, fulfilling uh, for the uh, demo. All right, so you need to make sure that this LED part is done. Okay, and at the same time, you also need to have a motor control function as well. All right, so one is what I just shown you, all right, and the other one is the motor control. So you need to also hook up your your driver chip and your motor, all right, and make sure that that part is also uh, functional, all right. And the reason why I want to uh, make this as a demo requirement is so that uh, a good part of the basic functionality is fulfilled, all right. Uh, by this time itself, all right? And this makes give you some confidence that, okay, I can do this, I can do that, and things are coming together, all right? Uh, again, why it's important? Because this forces you to sort of uh, spend some time and build up some of the basic blocks so that once the RTOS part and the multi threading comes in, you can straight away use this code and this hardware to, to build up on your project work, all right? So this is what you need to demonstrate. You do not need to explain anything. You do not need to the TS will not ask you any specific questions. As long as you can demonstrate this functionality, then it's fine. Okay, you don't need to worry about anything else. Okay, and of course, if things don't work, uh, you need to troubleshoot. Like I said, firstly, check that the protocol is correct. Let me your transmit side and receiver side, the protocol must be correct, must be the same. And if that part is correct, then check the pin, like how I hooked up the oscilloscope to the RX pin uh, of your your freedom board, hook up a scope and check whether what you're receiving is what you expect to receive. 
All right. So if all of that is correct, then the issue could be in your freedom board code. Okay, that means you're, the way you're interpreting the data or maybe you're, the way you're doing big masking, something is, is not quite right. Okay, so you need to troubleshoot step by step to figure out what is happening. Right? But once everything is okay and you have this whole uh, loop complete, then you have some sense of satisfaction because you know that a big part of the project is actually done. Okay, the, the lower level interface is done. All right, then you can focus on the RTOS part and then put everything together as the weeks go by. Okay, so that is why we have this uh, demo requirement. Okay, so uh, let me just finish up uh, the slides for the uh, and, and some admin matters before we end, end for today. Okay, so all these things I will not go through. Okay, uh, because those are what we just covered. For the intra parts is again very similar to just now. The only thing is you need to make sure you enable the interrupts, okay, for the transmit and receive. In our case, all right, uh, we only need the receive functionality, okay. So you don't need the transmit interrupt. You only need the receive interrupt. So that instead of polling, the moment the interrupt is uh, the moment the data packet is received, you can automatically jump to the ISR and process it. Okay, the queues, like I said. These are not needed. Okay, not needed. The queues are not needed for our project. It is just there to give you the idea of how a much more complex system might work. But in our case, every byte you transmit, you will automatically decode and process it. So you don't need to have a queue. Okay, so again, we're not handling errors. Okay, so just a few admin matters. Firstly, uh, with this chapter, like I said, we have already completed all the device drivers. That means after we come back from the recess uh, week, we will start with RTOS. Okay, so that is the good news. Then this Friday, uh, make sure all of you collect the chassis kit. Okay, uh, so at least one team member from uh, each team should go down to collect it. All right, uh, if you are asking one of your friends to collect on your behalf, it's also possible. All right, but please inform the TA on who you're collecting for and, and you will also need to capture your details as well so that we know who collected on whose behalf. Okay, and uh, once you collect that, okay, and with all the things that you already have, you can actually start working, okay, uh, towards doing the demo for the UART lab. All right, so I think you have about just slightly less than a month. All right, but I think there's more than enough time considering that the code uh, base for the UR, the PW, everything has been given to you. All right, you just need to put things together and demonstrate that it can work. Okay, now is the midterm. Okay, so for the midterm, uh, I've given you all a sample paper, okay, from one of the previous batch. Okay, uh, you can now look, do most of the questions except the part on the RTOS, the last few questions, but the earlier questions, all you should be able to attempt on your own first. All right, so I don't want to give you all the answer yet. I want you all to look at it and attempt it on yourself first. All right, and then later on, I will release the answers and I'll also release a video showing you the explanations on how we derive those answers. Okay, uh, so that is for you to have a first level practice on the type of questions that you face. Okay, uh, so let's go through some of the things for the midterm. It will be in week 9, 17 March. It will be the same time slot as your normal lecture. So it's not on a Saturday or any other time slot. Okay, so you should not clash with anything else. Okay, so you're all expected to be available. Okay, it will be one hour. It will be limited closed book with no internet access. Okay, you're allowed to have the soft copy of the data sheet with you. Okay, uh, you will be a luminous based quiz with Zoom proctoring using your handphone. I think. Most of you should be familiar with the whole process, kind of how to set up your phone uh, and, and, and log into the Zoom, okay, for the invigilator to, to uh, observe your activities. Uh, screen recording is mandatory, okay, and the recording needs to be uploaded for audio purposes, all right? So you need to make sure that you have tested your screen recording software, okay, and that you have sufficient storage for an hour long recording. Okay, so these are things that you have more than enough time to test and make sure that everything is working fine. All right, so throughout the entire uh, uh, quiz, you are supposed to turn on your screen recording software, 
And once everything is done, okay, you'll be given some time to upload that software, uh, that recording to the Luminous folder. All right, so these are things uh, you need to check and ensure that your PC uh, or your Mac, everything is, is uh, well equipped to do, all right? Uh, topics will be from one to 10. So as of today, we have covered topic eight. The topic nine and 10 both will be covered once we come back from recess week, all right? And the format of the quiz, again, similar to what we have been given so far, the sample paper, which will be what you should be MCQ around roughly around 20 questions, might be lesser or slightly more depending. Okay, but roughly around 20 questions. Okay, so I think this is enough information for now. All right, uh, more details and, and discussion of the last paper and all, I will send you all more information uh, once we come back from the recess week. Okay, so uh, that's all I have. Okay, um, any questions you all want to ask? regarding the midterm or the demo okay so good thank you i will see you all yeah after the break okay i'll send an announcement thanks thanks bye